as, as in the spirit of ecoversities, we'll, we'll just kind of start if people come in, if people leave. Um, that's how we've always, we've been doing any of our gatherings. So I'm um, happy that that kind of spirit can, can come in to this as well. Really happy to be um, supporting, um, hosting this session, changing the system from within the system. Um, my name is Kelly Teamy, and I'm calling or I'm zooming in from the occupied island of Hawaii, um, where I've been for a couple of years. And this kind of issue of um, trying to change the system from within is very close to my heart and close to my work um, for a long, long time. And um, I can, you know, just say that um, as somebody who's held up just the the intensity of what that work means and the difficulty of that, both to be able to stay in, but then to hold the kind of urgent changes that are needed at the same time within and, and bridging and then beyond. And um, so I'm just really excited to have, um, well, Miguel and Sharon and John here and hopefully Maud will be joining us from Botswana where it's um, midnight right now um, to talk about their own work, which is really wide ranging, diverse, but also overlapping. Um, and the idea is that everybody will have 10-ish minutes. Um, and it's nice we have a smaller group actually. And then at the end, um, that's okay. We'll just open things up and have a more kind of engaged conversation. So um, we're gonna start with Miguel. Um, Miguel, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your last name right. Is it is it Cesar? Casado, Casado. Okay, sorry. Um, so Miguel is an adjunct professor at Cal State Dominguez Hills and a doctoral researcher at the Center for the Transformation of Schools at UCLA. His scholarship and movement work um, are grounded, inspired by the critical, fugitive, abol abolitionist, and decolonial tra traditions focusing on the tensions, um, the potential that emerges in the third space between schooling, um, schooling as a project of social reproduction, racial violence, colonial and neoliberal assimilation, um, and the legitimizing of injustice and also education as a possibility um, for deep democracy, radical imagination, community healing and liberation. Thank you, thank you, Kelly. Appreciate that, and it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm going to share my screen um, from what I've put together for today, uh, and I look forward to to being in dialogue and to really uh, be in relationship and in dialogue. So, if you have any questions, if you feel uh, you know are compelled to ask a question or to speak up or something resonates with you, please feel free. Um, let me pull this up, and um, can you all? see my screen. Yeah, does it work? Okay, cool. I'm going to yeah. go into presentation mode. Um, so I guess uh, before, and to give some context uh, before I start, um, when I was initially sort of um, invited to this space and I read the title and I began to think about this idea of like changing systems from within, um, I was initially very like visually in some ways conflicted uh, because of the notion of being like within. Um, and it was kind of interesting because I, um, I, I work across different spaces and I, I begin, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the title of the session and even thinking about being a part of this conversation made me think a lot about what being in these spaces. And um, so I thought about this, this idea or this title of, of, of new metaphors for a revolutionary futurity, which is something that I draw upon from Freire, who was an educator, um, and is thinking about how to create the both revolutionary and hopeful sort of like state of the present that is connected to our future and to the futures that we can imagine and we can build. Um, and most of my work that is around policy making and theorizing um, about how these metaphors or these new metaphors could be a way to reclaim policy making and reclaim theorizing uh, as, as a practice of power and a different kind of power. So that's what I'll be talking about today. My name is Miguel Casar. I go by he, him pronouns. Um, like Kelly shared, I am an adjunct at Cal State Dominguez Hills. I work at a research center at UCLA. Uh, I'm in Tomba lands, also known as Los Angeles. Um, I also 
live in a whole bunch of different spaces, like social movements and activist spaces. Uh, a lot of them tied to I'm from Mexico. And I started my work in education um, doing work around indigenous sovereignty movements in, in Mexico. Um, and that's where I ended up in schools and, and, and thinking about how to reclaim schools as places where people could come together, imagine different kinds of futures, build and fight and struggle towards those futures. Uh, but I also found the connection between schooling as a project of sort of like colonialism and as a project of assimilation as a very violent project towards those who were not considered uh, to be at the center uh, uh, of schooling. So anyway, so that's kind of where I where I where I'm at and where I come from. Um, I put this here just as a way of introduction because I think throughout my life I've been inside and outside often and I always have to move between these spaces. Uh, and I also think that you know we often imagine and we think about inside and outside as very, I guess, like demarcated, like different processes. And, uh, you know, so we think about, for example, in terms of policymaking, we think of like inside policymaking, which is like big P policy, you know, people sitting in halls of power, quote unquote, writing policies that they use to legitimize, you know, their governance over us or their ways of life, their living and life and um, over the rest of us. Um, or for example, higher education institutions, right? Those like the ivory tower, the insiders who hold knowledge uh, versus the rest of the world who don't, and they have a right to write what is you know, true and legitimate and of value and, then, uh, and to theorize in this case about the rest of the world or others. Um, and also sort of like the outside, we also imagine it or understand it as a different kind of space uh, that is perhaps more like bottom up, more sovereign, uh, we often think of communities or schools or institutions outside of sort of like dominant mainstream institutions. Um, and I think in my work, while this is kind of like a useful metaphor for some things, in my work, I've also found the inside and outside to something like this, which is something that is very, very messy. Um, there is policy making that is happening on the ground that is deeply intertwined with state institutions. There's also struggles and social movements that have fought to claim space within mainstream institutions in things like schooling. So in some ways the struggles and the imaginaries and the futures are already embedded within some of these structures. There's, for example, even in outside spaces you find, um, and there's, there's a lot to pull from, but there's also, you know, you find sort of like remnants of colonial logics, right? This idea of like decolonizing the mind, the idea that the inside in some ways lives also in the outside uh, and so forth. So, so anyway, so I thought about kind of like first in, in thinking about the ins and the outs and the outs and the ins, I think that we have, or I have, at least in my own work, a long lineage of sort of people who have negotiated these dynamics. No? So I'm pulling from sort of like fugitive and abolitionist traditions, which are, you know, groups of people and movements and struggles that have even you know, amidst or in the middle of very oppressive situations, they have managed to create fugitivity, fugitive spaces to think of themselves and their freedom and their power in very interesting ways uh, within these very oppressive sort of like structures. Um, and also in the abolitionist traditions, like what does it mean to dismantle these institutions and to recreate them, uh, right? Uh, in terms of freedom dreams, I think there's also like lots of people who have imagined freedom what it, what it looks like and what it feels like and what it works like within quote unquote unfree spaces. I love that also. Um, anyways, and I'm also pulling from like decolonizing and indigenous movements that again, in a settler colonial context, they're also having to contend with some of these issues uh, of autonomy and sovereignty, but also living within brother structures. Um, and more specifically to my work, I use a lot of like third space and critical theory as a way to think about um, instead of either or, but like what, what comes in the third space? Like how can we generate from the contradictions of these two rather than to think of them as separate and independent? Um, so I think my question was like, how do we build metaphors that are generative and are productive as we participate in the transformation of our home, right? So as we seek to do work, recognizing that we are you know, destroying our world and engaging in very violent and, 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 and um, and problematic relationships with each other, sometimes more willingly than others. Um, how do we create a metaphor for the ins and outs that is generative and productive? 
Um, and the second part was how do we build upon people who have strategized already, right? There's there's a lot of, so for example, like I'm, I use a lot of like dual power frameworks. I worked with Zapatistas for some time and they're a group of people and, and a struggle that is really thought about. They pulled from Lenin and Lenin has this thing called like dual power frameworks, which is you build kind of like alternate institutions. And once you, you, you build them and you strengthen them and you can sustain them, then it renders these other oppressive institutions like futile in some ways. So they, they've done a lot of work to build their own schools, right? To build their own governance structures uh, in ways where, where, where these other institutions of the legitimacy um, and how these dominant institutions have negotiated their legitimacy become futile or become absurd or their violent nature is revealed in some ways. Um, I don't want, I think I'm taking too much time in this, uh, pero, Anyways, all this to say that, that these are some of the things that inform my work, right? Think about some of these. I think about people like the Mac Marx and his idea of the boroughs, the undercommons, thinking more specifically of the university, the MST in Brazil. They have a different idea around taking over government institutions that are not working, making them work, and, and therefore building a type of power and a co-governance model with states that, that, that makes it very difficult um, for the state to to be against them in some ways. That's a very interesting strategy. Um, anyways, so these are some of the, the actual strategies that I pull from or that I'm using to think and to inform my own work. And ultimately, I think the question, at least for me, is like, how do I and my community and the people around me um, where I'm at in the world can work towards creating? In other words, what uh, Tara Brown here calls participatory insurgency, but this idea of, uh, you know, basically about fighting for the world that I believe in or that that is more just and more uh, at least uh, sustainable in some ways. So, and I'm pulling from three examples of three different projects that I have at the moment. The first one is a project that, uh, alongside young people in California and Eastside Union, where we have, for a long time, we've been organizing to take more power and to claim power over decision-making spaces in school districts. So, so, so this is an example of like what started as a community organization that fought to take control or claim power over their schools. And we've been sort of um, slowly kind of like building to take more space in the district office and to inform policy making and to have young people and especially marginalized young people take space and take up space in policy making and in practice. Um, and in this case, California passed a policy that is called Del CFF that in theory gives more control to local communities over the budgets and school budgets. So that was kind of like an opportunity of something that we also put to pass Del CFF, but that became an opportunity, kind of like a wedge to really, really start thinking about budgets and resources and money and community control and so forth. So, you know, this is a case study that showed a lot of really interesting things. The second piece that I'm showing here is something called theorizing back. And this is, this is work that I've been doing uh, with young people who are incarcerated or have been incarcerated in like re-entry settings. Um, and this is really about questioning who gets to story the world and who writes theory and whose theory gets to represent other people's lives and other people's identities and how can we theorize back and how can we upset some of that stuff. Uh, and the last one is in Los Angeles County for a long time, I was a part of a, a collective and a, and a coalition of organizations that were fighting to defund school police. We were fighting to defund carceral institutions, um, probation. They got piles of money and to kind of like move that towards a more caring, kind, loving uh, infrastructure in LA County, just infrastructure in LA County. Um, and what, what was interesting about this is that we, it was a long struggle we've, we've, we won, uh, and now we're at the space where we are building an office of youth development. We're planning for the building of an office of youth development, a department of youth development, actually, that is gonna have a lot of resources and power over the county. And we're thinking about how to create participatory governance structures for this office so that young people that have been system impacted can guide the work of this space. Um, so anyways, those are kind of like a summary of these three projects. And I, 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 I know I've said a lot, so hopefully uh, I'm making some sense, but um, 
And hopefully I'll try to put these together and to think of how both of, how the three of them kind of like operate within, but also without. And, and, and often, you know, some of these live in higher ed, have people from higher ed, live in schooling as a, as a dominant institution, but also have community orgs and activists and, and, and these other kinds of spaces. Um, and the three of them are negotiating the complexities of doing this work, sort of like in and out systems or inside systems. Um, so I think, you know, this is the first one. Um, and it started as a, as a space of praxis. We started with young people just hosting these conversations where we got to read together and to, um, they would bring, you know, we'd read like Freire and Fanon and um, sort of like very critical literature, but also like Tupac and they brought their own work and we wrote together. So it began as a space of praxis inside uh, the prison. And interestingly, you know, often we think and, and specifically thinking about sort of like abolitionist or fugitive spaces, we often wonder whether there is a possibility to have liberatory and emancipatory spaces within very confined, you know, oppressive structures like a prison. So, so the, the original intent is how can we incubate this type of, of work? And it led to us writing this book together because they started recognizing that everybody was speaking about them, right? There were tons and piles of books about pushouts and dropouts and criminal youth, right? And like, and they became sort of like a hanger for all kinds of people to hang explanations on their stories and their identities. Um, so they decided to, we decided to start theorizing back. So we've been writing a book together and, and, and it's been really interesting. We've been writing, reading social theory about them and then writing a book together. Um, and I'm gonna skip this, but one of the things that has come up is that they're coming up with some very interesting ways of navigating things that, that um, and theories that, you know, for example, like the contradiction between structure and agency and how we often think of whether, you know, young people choose or whether it's like structures that choose for them and like it has implications for the justice system. And so they, they and they begin to use, uh, apparently I'm at the 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, all right, I'm gonna try to rush. It's all good, it's all good. No, I always talk too much, I appreciate it. Um, so um, anyway, so that's that. Then the other one, um, I think just, what I wanted to share about it is that um, it's really questioning like who gets, who makes policy. And we often think of policy as a piece of paper that some people somewhere else make. Um, and it's a very like inside job. And, and this project has really forced us to grapple with like what I'm calling like small p policy. And that means policy as is made by people on the ground every day. Uh, and how can we visibilize this type of policy making and to, and to begin to push it into not only um, these big P places, but also like um, governance and how do we think about policy so that we visualize these processes and we can use them to build more power. Um, anyways, we've learned many lessons from it. Um, and then the last one is that I think it's an interesting example of something that, that started on the outside, started in very radical activist spaces and now lives within a, a county and a department at the county where, where now we have an opportunity to, to bring a different set of logics to how the county operates and, and to really create participatory governance structures, to really think about power and equity in power and whose voices inform, right? And like how by structure we, we silence and we uh, push some people out of the conversation. So how do we center them and how do we, anyways. and you know, it's a really powerful and important and, and, and it's been really beautiful, but at the same time, it's been very difficult because of course we're starting to bump into the bureaucracies and the limitations and the, and the people who are like, yeah, we love youth, but we don't really wanna, we wanna hear you, but we don't really wanna hear you or we wanna hear you, but we don't necessarily, um, you know, sort of this like very like superficial. Um, but then something that has been interesting is that they, from the activist world, they've also been forced to reckon with a lot of complexities that were not necessarily negotiated on the outside. So being sort of, you know, at this, at this more like government sort of like bigger um, structure has forced a lot of the people who were part of the activism to think of, um, of their work very differently and to sit at a position of a lot of responsibility with a lot of complexities, with a lot of different opinions, um, and to grapple with this future that when imagined felt very simple, but when enacted became very complicated. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. And the only thing that I wanted to say as a reflection and sort of like a, 
a future question perhaps for me is, is that I, these three projects kind of, for me at least, they speak to how, one is how both policy making and theorizing um, are producing meanings, subjectivities and peoples and they're structuring um, sort of like people and our worlds um, all the time. And there's like an opportunity for us to, to claim space over that process. There's an opportunity for us to occupy and to, and to, and to inform that process. And second is that the, what I'm calling here sort of like a slow motion apocalypse that we're in, in some ways, it relies on this sort of like normative reproduction of silence and silencing, right? Like it, it depends on, on this, it becoming the norm. Even if it's an apocalypse, it's become the norm and it's become accepted as a norm in some ways, so not necessarily ubiquitously accepted, but anyway. So I think for me, in thinking about the in and out, the more that we can create the nurture and sustain spaces that disrupt these silences, both inside and outside, um, and, and, and kind of like negotiate the contradictions, both of being in the, in the inside or the outside, um, the better we can situate our work and ourselves as connected to like a broader struggle for justice. And I'll leave it. Thanks, Miguel. Um, wow, there's so much we could we could go into there. Um, I hope we can. Does anybody have any kind of you know any burning questions, or can we hold them until the end? Um, I was it was really beautiful just hearing about the disruption of boundaries, you know, between you at the university, between these confined spaces, between county governments. So, wow, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so Sharon Stein is going to be our next speaker. Have you seen Sharon in what five years? Last time I saw you was in the jungles of Costa Rica, the second Ecoversities Alliance gathering. Um, it's great to see you, even if on a screen again. <laughs> um, so Sharon's a faculty member um, in, the, in the Department of Educational Studies at the University of British Columbia in what is currently known as Canada. She studies the complexities and challenges involved in deep in decolonizing and internationalizing higher education, both within and beyond formal institutions. And she's a founding member of the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures C C Collective. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's lovely to see you and, and share the space with you. Um, I am joining you uh, actually, so UBC is on Musqueam territory, but I'm on Stolo territory today. But um, in any case, I do you want to just reiterate that um, we probably need to go beyond these acknowledgements of, of our complicity and harm and figure out what it means to be supporting the struggles of Indigenous peoples to have their lands returned to them. And I know for settlers like me, what that means is pretty very much an open question, but it's one that is uh, very central to the work that I do and um, carry it with me in in everything I think about in relation to the university. Um, so yeah, the tensions of, of work, not only in my case, working in the colonial university, but also studying it. It's, it's like, it's these many layers. It's my area of scholarship to, to sort of um, examine the colonial foundations of, of higher education and settler colonial contexts um, like the US and Canada. And it's, um, it's been an interesting journey, to be sure, um, of, of moving in and out of these spaces in conversation with so many different kinds of people, with so many different perspectives about what the university is and what it should be. And I've found that one of my roles in all that is as a kind of translator um, within and beyond the university. And it's, um, it has been quite an education, I feel like. <laughs> I got a second PhD in just like the, that, that translational work of, of work going between indigenous community spaces, between activist spaces, between the university, and then within the university itself, there's all these translations. And um, it's actually a, a, a fun challenge <laughs> um, in some ways, but, and it's not easy. And I think, you know, I've come to a place where I realized that there's no pure space in any of this work everything we do as, well, I, I'd say as a settler like myself, whether I'm in the university or not, I'm bringing that colonial baggage and that colonial debt with me. And what that looks like depends on what work I'm doing. But just because I leave the colonial university doesn't mean the colonial university leaves me. So um, 
you know, I work with Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures Collective, as Kelly mentioned, and um, we are an interdisciplinary, international, intergenerational collective of, um, yes, academics, but also artists, educators, students, Indigenous communities, and we really work at the interface of these questions about systemic uh, colonial violence and ecological unsustainability. And we do that in many different contexts. And I think um, we really see our role, not only in that like translator role, but also in the role of supporting the people in those spaces who wanna catalyze change. And that is in the areas of education, of course, but also arts, conservation and sustainability, philanthropy, people working in science, people working in health, food systems. And um, we also have another set of relationships, which are relationships with indigenous communities in Canada, Brazil, and Peru. And uh, <laughs> trying to navigate all of those different relationships is really also another, <laughs> maybe a third PhD of that different kinds of relational work. Um, and trying to put ourselves at service of what is needed in these different spaces in order to move us towards healthier possibilities for coexistence. Um, always with that sense of accountability to, let's say everyone and everything, but in particular accountability for our complicity and systemic historical and ongoing violence. And we do that through um, creating different kinds of pedagogical, artistic and embodied experiments that try to work with um, identifying, interrupting, and healing the harms of colonialism. And these are not just intellectual experiments, but also affective and relational ones. Um, and like Miguel, we also draw on many critical literatures and also um, the insights of our collaborations with indigenous communities, um, which is something we try to do with trust, respect, reciprocity, consent, and accountability, as opposed to the you know, tendency to approach it in an extractive and appropriative way. I wouldn't say we always do it well and we always succeed. There's lots of failures involved, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but I think the people in the collective as a whole kind of realize that we need people in all different kinds of spaces doing this work and pushing to the extent that it's possible in their space, meeting the people in those spaces where they're at, um, identifying the ones who can catalyze change, and um, it depends on our positionality. It depends on our, the opportunities that present themselves. And it also depends on our sort of individual gifts. It, it sort of dictates who does what in relation to the collective. Um, but I think collectively we are trying to, to identify the cracks uh, where these things can move. And one of the things in terms of institutions that we've identified is that even within the institution, you need different kinds of critique. So we've kind of identified about five different kinds of critical interventions within a space like the university, uh, within and sort of outside. So you have the, the refusers is the first group, the first set. And those are the people that don't want anything to do with the university. They don't even wanna speak back to the university. They're just like, fuck it, goodbye. <laughs> And that's, that's important. We need, so we need all of these just to, as a preface. Um, and then we have also the, the Barkers who are kind of at the edges of the university, pushing the university, like we need reparations, we need land back, we need um, sort of demands that the university are, is kind of, it's legible to them, but they're not gonna take seriously unless they really have uh, been pushed beyond, um, you know, unless public opinion changes as it is shifting, I think. Um, but we're not there yet. So you have the Barkers who are pushing and who the university um, attends to only if it feels like it's gonna hurt its PR, if it doesn't. Um, but then you have sort of like, I would also say the Barkers and the Growlers who are people who are kind of in the university, but sort of at the margins, um, sorry, the Growlers and the Stompers in the universities at the margins and kind of showing that, you know, it's the status quo is gonna be, needs to be interrupted, but not pushing so far that they get pushed out of the, of the institution altogether. Um, and I think the, the, the last piece would be the steerers, we call them like the people who kind of do have some relationship to those in power to the point where they can, they, where they may even be consulted about like, oh, okay, I see that the refusers 
and the barkers have a problem, but I don't really understand why. And I don't understand what it means to us. And so the steerers and maybe even the stompers can sort of do that translational work. Um, and maybe something's possible, knowing that it can always be co-opted and that the machine is much bigger than we are. So I think um, sometimes in these different critical spaces, we see each other as in competition with each other. Um, but there's also a way of thinking it as an ecology of critical interventions. And if you strategically work together, then that's when I see the most change happening. Where we work, for instance, with the refusers, and we say, we, we go to the institution and say, they're not even um, gonna get involved and here's why, or th this is why they're so angry and they sign a petition and they're occupying your office. Um, and I think, you know, it depends on even the issue in which like I might be a steerer in relation to one issue and a barker in relation to another. So uh, I think we all have to figure out what our different roles are, but mapping these different modes of critique and the importance of them all um, has been really useful in kind of um, navigating in the institution and staying somewhat sane. And then I think the last piece also is that if, as uh, we kind of have the analysis, these institutions, not just the university, but um, many other modern colonial institutions are probably not sustainable in the long term, neither kind of ethically for sure, but also even um, sort of practically speaking, then you can move to a space of disinvesting from the institution without necessarily leaving the institution. You might leave or you might not, but you say, my investment is in the possibility of a different kind of future. And the institution may be a place in which that can be supported by funneling resources um, outside of the institution to other spaces or for using the time that we have in the university to plan other things and work with other communities. Um, so then the investment is in the possibilities that are enabled rather than the institution itself. And then when the institution is colonial and when our interventions don't work as they often don't, there's not as much disappointment <laughs> because it's like, well, of course the colonial university is gonna colonize. So, you know, we didn't expect anything different but we're still gonna try because we are here and we have accountabilities to this place as well as to places beyond it. And this could be one of many places and sites of intervention. So I think the last thing I wanna share is just um, recognizing that whether we're working in the institution or not, there is a lot of inevitable mistakes in this process of trying to imagine something different uh, of education, whether higher education or otherwise. And I think in the collective, it's really important for us to have that hyper self-reflexivity about um, learning from our mistakes so that we don't continue to make the same mistakes. Uh, we'll probably make new ones, but we, we don't wanna keep going in circles. So um, I, I will share in the chat when I'm done, but I'll just share, you know, we have sort of a, a peer review that we do <laughs> in the collective that we decided to share outward um, of a set of questions that can help us think through um, how we might be, uh, well, the first question is actually, how are you, to what extent are you reproducing what you critique? Which I think in this work, for those of us who have been socialized in the system, that's gonna be inevitable um, to a certain extent. And it's not about trying to eradicate that entirely because it's probably not possible, but let's at least start noticing and seeing how we can interrupt that and how we can do things differently. Um, and then another question would be like, what are you doing this for? Who are you accountable to? What's your theory of change? And what would you like your work to move in the world? And then that is the orienting thing rather than I need to do it here or here. If, you, if you're oriented by what you think you can do based on your gifts and your positionalities, then you kind of open the strategic mode in a different way than like, I wanna be here or I wanna be here. Um, another question we often ask, especially those of us in the university, is to what extent are you aware of how you're being read by communities of high intensity struggle? And I know, <laughs> I see myself through other people's eyes in meetings sometimes, um, and I know they're rolling their eyes at me because like, it sounds so ridiculous. And um, oftentimes we water down the critique or we only do part of it or whatever, because we know that that's what's gonna be heard or hearable in that space, knowing that we're bracketing a lot of other things in the process, but also knowing that if we bring the Barker's critique full on first thing, we're just gonna get shut down. So it's not that we read ourselves through other people's eyes to then shut ourselves down, but again, trying to be 
as accountable as possible, um, being strategic while also maintaining the integrity of the work. And it's not always a clear line where that is. Um, so I think the last few I'll mention is this question of like, how wide is the gap between where you think you're at and where you're actually at? Because we tend to overestimate how far like advanced we are in this work and underestimate just how much work is required to unlearn this colonial stuff. Um, and as honest as we can be about that, I think we uh, is the better because um, if we stay in the space of, dis of illusion, um, well, usually it comes crashing down on us, especially when there's a crisis. Usually when there's a crisis and a conflict, that's where you see where you're really at. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and I will put in the chat the, the full set of questions that might be useful to others doing this kind of work in various different spaces and, and I look forward to being in conversation with you all. Oh, thanks, Sharon. Wow, so much to think about. I love these questions and also the categories. It's so helpful. I could have used this so many times in the past. <laughs> it's a real gift just, just hearing about this and also this idea of a kind of the ecology of intervention. That's, yeah, awesome. Hope we can get into some of this um, later in this in this session. Um, I'm going to transition to John Foran, um, who I haven't gotten to meet in person yet, I don't think, but um, met you online in some different really cool spaces. Um, so John, John teaches sociology at University of California, Santa Barbara as his day job, but most of the time he lives the life of a scholar activist in the global climate justice movement. Um, at the center of the struggle for achieving social justice and radical social change, um, in this in this 21st century. One manifestation of this locally um, that he's really involved in is the Eco Vista Eco Village that he's been working on dreaming into existence with a group of other kindred folks. John believes that activism needs to centralize spirituality that works on our inner transitions to nurture relationships. Oh, so that's my cue. Thank you very much, Kelly. <clears throat> no, we haven't met in person. I would love to come to Hawaii one day first time in my life, so love it, love it. And by the way, everyone here is welcome to visit Santa Barbara, California, if you ever have an opportunity. We would love to see you and have you be hosted here. Thank you for the introduction, and that's what I call my cosmic bio, which is, um, oh, actually, there's more to it. Yeah, let me read a little bit more of my cosmic bio by way of introduction, which I think is appropriate in this group, because I've come to I've fallen in love with ecoversities over the last year and a half, and I've been to so many wonderful gatherings, and to have this chance to participate uh, is thrilling. So I believe that just as spirituality remains a wasted gesture unless put into some kind of practice outside of oneself in the world, I also feel that far too much activism falls short of its potential for liberation because groups and individuals fail to acknowledge and work on the inner transition and nurturing of relationships that the best spiritual practices enable in us. I'm an unabashed eclecticist when it comes to both spirituality and activism. And I believe that we're called at this time to be applying our imagination, our deepest being, our most creative uh, and unbounded imagination, I see I said that again, to the task at hand, which is nothing short of a complete transformation of the way we live. And I wanted to uh, signal uh, how wonderful it was to wake up at 630 and go to the session this morning um, with bio in conversation um, with someone else who was equally wonderful whom I didn't know and, and and the words that came out of their mouths were like poetry and it was very Sophie Strand thank you so much um it was really astonishing I, I recommend that everyone have a look at that recording if and when you have a moment <clears throat> so yeah I teach at the University of California which likes to call itself the biggest the best public university in the world. It's a set of 10 campuses. I'm on one of the smaller ones in the lovely town of Santa Barbara, California, 100 miles north of Los Angeles. Actually, the university is eight miles to the north of the town of Santa Barbara, and this is relevant because 
adjacent to it is a community of about 20,000 people living in a square mile um, right on the Pacific Ocean um, called Isla Vista. And in Isla Vista, 80% of the residents are between the ages of 18 and 24. And the remaining 20% are the more permanent residents, which consists of families with children, many of them Spanish speaking, um, or Latino, Latina, Latinx in culture, um, a houseless population and senior citizens. And so this Eco Vista dream world, um, which I guess I, I think I put the link in the chat as a, no, I didn't. So um, I'm gonna put a bunch of links. So I'm gonna bombard you. And that's a very ill chosen term, I think in the shadow of the war that's happening right now that's on basically all our minds. Um, and I'm actually going to suggest you take a moment of silence right now um, and put our thoughts to it in our hearts to the people of Ukraine. If you teach on topics, if you have the luxury, the opportunity, the privilege of getting to kind of choose the topics you teach in a university, which is kind of my situation, 32 years, my whole career after my PhD has been spent at UC Santa Barbara. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that came up, some of the opportunities we grabbed and created out of thin air um, and share with you, as I said, a number of links to those materials. Um, because of course, we wanna make everything we do available uh, to everyone for free. Um, yeah, in all my classes, we start with a check-in. How are people doing uh, at the moment? Well, we don't do that in a class of 100, but we do it in smaller classes. And um, it's a way of keeping, uh, becoming a group together on as level a plane as it can be given the hierarchy built into the, uh, the university classroom. Um, and then we talk about the news, the news that's relevant to the topics. And my topics are uh, called, one's called The World in 2050, Building Systemic Alternatives, um, another is a class on Eco Vista, this remarkable transition town effort to turn that community into something uh, like a just transition or a local Green New Deal or an eco village um, that has been the centerpiece of my heart and my teaching for the last several years. And that too, I just stumbled into. The title I put for today, uh, well, first a comment on the title of this panel, Changing the System from Within the System, um, is precisely, of course, what we're called to do if we are within the system. And of course, it's a privileged position for many, many people and not all in the university. Um, and an increasingly sort of imperiled uh, situation. Um, for scholars, new scholars, young scholars coming into the university, trying to get into the university and trying to create spaces if they're lucky enough to, to succeed. Um, so I'm speaking from a position of privilege after 32 years and tenure and um, many, many spaces uh, to, to do my best. And I guess what I would say is then you just try to you try everything in your power to commit your teaching and your research and your service in the community and your politics, your activism beyond. Um, you try and use the university, basically. The title of my little talk is Changing or Using the University from Within to Confront the Climate Crisis, which is the thing that's on my mind every day. Um, first things I'll drop into the chat are links to three uh, essays um, that I've written that are sort of 
uh, direct critiques of the university, including my own discipline of sociology. And that link is to a chapter in a book with the uh, title Sleepwalking is a Death Sentence for Humanity, uh, which is a, a wake up call, which too few of my colleagues are listening to, but which circumstances are going to force upon us. Um, and secondly, is a similar kind of early piece that uh, was one of the first public things I wrote, public facing, as they say, things I wrote um, way back in 2010 to sort of colleagues and others who work on global studies. Um, and it was a call to go beyond the classroom uh, to start to do the work, to find the ways to turn the classroom into a space um, where folks can learn skills and have opportunities to actually do things outside the classroom. And that's what I finally, as I say, stumbled into with this opportunity to be part of EcoVista. The final piece uh, along these lines I'll give you is a three-part piece which actually uh, sort of culminates in my discovery of uh, the Ecoversities Alliance in the summer of 2020 and my astonishment at what the Ecoversities Alliance was doing. And it's from that date that um, I've tried to not miss anything that's happening. And it's just the most impressive network I can think of and recommend to any scholar inside the university and of course outside the university needless to say. There's so much to learn in these spaces. And it just, my again, I'm just touched in my heart and my soul and with the people that I meet. And that's true generally of activism as well, which is sort of the secret I tell students that it's fun to do these things. The people that you meet are amazing. And the things that you can do together uh, will astonish you. Um, the, other couple of projects are networks of radical educators that I've had a chance to um, be part of. One is on the campus of the University of California and that's called the Environmental and Climate Justice Hub, um, which has been going five or six years. And one of our main activities is to hold an online uh, what the, its originator, Ken Hiltner, in the English department modestly calls a nearly carbon neutral conference. Um, and I gave you the link to the one from 2019, which is about teaching. Um, and these are pre recorded talks. Now on Zoom, we all do this. Um, and, you know, again, one of the unforeseeable outcomes of the pandemic the pandemic still in very much in progress is that networks have sprung up everywhere and connections have been made and you know ecoversities itself i understand had face-to-face -face meetings and when it was founded that were transformative for folks and of course i'm jealous of that but i don't think we live in a world anymore where we can fly to some place those of us who can in the first place afford to do it to do this kind of, of work and i'm naturally very proud of Ecoversities for joining the sort of movement to do this all online. It's, it's one of the, you know, it's a ridiculous contradiction in terms for climate scientists and scholars to fly to conferences to give a 15 minute talk about some minutiae of the discipline uh, to a, a small group of other people that is, is not recorded and just for nothing to be honest. Um, and that's pretty much my critique of my discipline. Too much of it is, is wasted, the way we write, the audiences we speak to. We really have to break out of that at the same time as we make sure that the university doesn't take our job away for not publishing the sorts of things they want us to publish. The second network is uh, a bit larger in scale. It's a network of the UC uh, and California State University Systems. And Miguel started us off as a representative of that amazing system, um, the largest network of, of university students I've ever heard of. Um, and it's called Next Terra, Next Earth. And what we did was 
create a, this group uh, drawn from many disciplines. We created a website for teachers at the university and high school levels and um, students on the climate crisis, climate justice as a response and critical sustainability is kind of a, a gesture in the direction of systemic alternatives. And it's organized by topics and I get to do climate justice movements and systemic alternatives. The latter very much influenced by um, you know, the, the Pluriverse Project, the amazing book that Ashish Kotari and many others brought out, and the Global Tapestry of Alternatives, the network space uh, that is taking that work forward. And when I teach about systemic alternatives, which is my passion, we all read Pluriverse. And um, to, to be in those spaces, they have a network too called Pedagog, which stands for some crazy acronym. Um, that's about to, I think, become more and more public, and I, I'm sure is aiming toward uh, Ecoversities Alliance, just as the GTA itself is. So I think I have to stop. Um, what I wanted to stop with was a couple of connections to the work that we do in the community, um, and that is the link to uh, the uh, EcoVista itself a very DIY, uh, you name it, you get to try it project um, that's been going for three or four years and has great dreams and some successes. And then a piece I wrote about it, um, which will give a, a more rich uh, sort of way of thinking about it. But the website itself is very rich. We have a climate justice press, we're publishing books, fiction, nonfiction, uh, children's materials, po poetry, um, again, to create a press where people who couldn't publish perhaps or don't want to publish their work uh, in restricted spaces uh, can come and uh, we'll be more than happy to publish you if it's relevant to the general project of co-creating the world that we hope to live in. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um... Wow. <laughs> um, uh, Addy, I don't know if, um, I just want to make sure we can save also the chat um, alongside the, the audio recording and we can, we can have that available for everyone too. Um, yeah, I'd love to open up. Hmm? Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm actually not able to save the chat on my iPad. Do you know, okay. if, are, is someone else able to? I can save it. I always save the chat, so I'll do that for you for us. Thanks, John. <laughs> no, I've done it once before too, but I don't kind of, yeah, I'm definitely not Zoom fluent either. Um, so I think it'd be great if we could just open things up if anyone has questions, comments, thoughts, and and um, and maybe stretch a bit as well. I know I need to, but um, we can, yeah, just spend the rest of our time having, having a conversation. Would anyone like to like to start? <clears throat> Sorry. Are we are we just jumping in or are we getting I think cold? I think hand is yeah hand is helpful and we can yeah and or if you want to post it in the chat but I mean because there's not that many of us it's easier if we can just yeah. Yeah. So am I good to go? I'm not sure if there's anybody else. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thanks a lot. Um quite rich so I'm trying to remember who said what but as somebody else in, in higher education in an institution first of all I'm really impressed you're also organized in networks um, and that's kind of gets to the core of my question I found in all the various groups I've been in and out of often I basically uh, what shall I say uh, the power dynamics in these groups I found often very problematic so I think in Sharon's uh, a contribution this came to the surface most you know we all have our internal colonialisms and if the problems out there changing the university without making it part of a self-reflexive self sorry it's late here self-reflexive exercise and also contemplating the, the dynamics within the group i found myself at the end of the day getting really peeved most very often because there usually is somebody grabbing the power 
and and either you have a power struggle which i'm not interested in and i have limited time i think the workload issue is enormous certainly where i am i'm just barely managing to i mean i don't know and it, you know it didn't used to be like this but now it's kind of like how, how do you manage to have a life beyond the, the sort of what you need to do i mean that's a sort of practical question but so so the key question for me really is that how do you negotiate that? It sounds like this happy world of ecological or, or alternative networks and all these problems that you have maybe in the workplace with, you know, I, I certainly find in my university context, the, the, the dynamics have changed massively with the neoliberal, and I'm in the UK, I have to say. I used to work in the US, totally different story. Um, UK is just something else. Um, it's become so competitive, it's completely eroded collegiality. And then if you walk into these other spaces and you're trying to do something and you, you know, the do-gooder syndrome, which is also really problematic, it's still run by the same competitive instincts or, or it's very difficult um, to, to basically to find, that, that's been my experience. So I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to hear how people navigate this, whether they find it in these groups, because it sounds like it's this happy world of networking, and I'm wondering what I'm doing wrong, <laughs> and um, and you know, or what strategies people have found to negotiate these problems, because how can you sustain a movement or some kind of alternative practice or, or even build something if these fundamental issues haven't been resolved. And I'm certainly hearing from other people as well that all the projects are involved in their immense conflicts in the groups and that stymies progress. And yet it's really important to also find a way of negotiating them constructively because that's part of the process. I think just... Sharon, Miguel, John, anyone else? Yeah, let's just. Um... <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think that I really appreciate the question because I think it does capture uh, the contradictions and complexities of this work. And I think sometimes, especially when we're burnt out from the mainstream institutional context, we make these alternative spaces and relationships assuming that we're gonna do it differently and um, I think, you know, usually to some extent we do, and to some extent we reproduce the same problem, but there is a like tendency to romanticize the alternative space as something that's going to be free of that, and then that's usually disappointing. <laughs> so I think that's why um, I shared the link about learning from failure, because so much of uh, our learnings in the collective, including the things that we share, are they start with our own learning and our own mistakes, even internally to our dynamics. Um, and, you know, we try, you know, the people who have these stable, steady jobs, like in the, in the university to redistribute as much as we can, but that doesn't, you know, flatten inequities. Um, and I think, you know, what we have tried to do, like for me, I, fe I feel I have two jobs. I have my job in the university and I have my job in the work. I call it the job in the work. Um, and luckily for me, the job can subsidize the work, not just for me, but also for other people, which is, you know, one way of trying to, to negotiate this. But I think it's absolutely true. We need to learn to have difficult conversations without relationships falling apart. And usually we gravitate toward either going along to get along and not like avoiding that, like avoiding the conflict, or we do this thing of like competing for who's the most critical or who's the most radical or whatever. And I think we need to figure out a different way and again as you said like we're trained in the competition way or in the feeling like we have to be better than way or whatever in our institutions and um, that unlearning is very difficult so you know in our collective we try to we have all these tools in part to hold ourselves accountable like orienting compasses of humility honesty hyper self-reflexivity and humor so that we don't get caught in those traps but um it happens to all of us. And luckily we, we're kind of there to hold each other and hold each other accountable so that we can try and get back on track when we fall into those ditches. But it's absolutely true, it's not easy work. And I appreciate you raising that point. Yeah, so I just wanna jump in super quick. There's something that really resonated with me and that I was thinking about is that I often think that um, 
And I also say this as somebody that has miserably failed, I think, to negotiate the balance, I think, of the institution. So it hasn't been, I haven't found a way to make it this like very like nurturing, um, um, life-giving or soul-affirming space for me, but that I've found in other spaces. That said, I do think that, you know, in, in, in negotiating, at least for me, the issue of like power and bumping into power and the, the powers that as we understand them classically I think that for me even like the work of Spinoza and he has this idea of thinking about power as like potentia and potestas and, and thinking about where does power live and how can we reframe where does it live and where does it sit um, I'm not talking about like power as it is distributed as if it was static but as it, as it is being misdistributed like all the time I think that it's been really useful for us to with the county with the university to make it impossible in some ways for them to, to wield um, their way of thinking about power because we've created like very participatory um, structures that um, like kind of like force them to reckon with the contradictions of trying to wield their power. Um, so in some ways, I think that, um, and that has been just a, a part of creating a strategy that is very deliberate and so how do we I, and I think Sharon used this language, but this like this like crack, how to find these cracks. And 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 there's nobody who will say, like, no, we're not gonna listen to the people, or we continue to believe that, you know, sort of like white old people with power need to control the world and it's working out all right. Like, um, so you create those spaces and um anyways, for us it's been it's been successful at least in in allowing to sustain the movements and to grow them without being sort of like pushed down by the powers of the year, the university or the county year. Thanks. Thanks, Miguel and, and Sharon. I, I I resonate very much too. I know in Ecoversities we've been trying to deal with a lot of different conflicts in different ways, experimenting with different people. Um, you know, we've had big debates even if, you know, if people who work in the university system should be part of Ecoversities because there's those who really want them out. So it's it's a constant issue of I think ultimately it's ego, and that's what we all are trying to deal with, whether whatever your background is, whatever your colonial, you know, skin background, I think it's something we keep coming back to and we keep failing over and over again, but then learning and still loving at the same time. So um, yeah, I, I feel like that should be a session in and of itself. Um, um, I'm, I'm, is, is it Usa? Usa? Yeah, it's also, awesome. it's like horse, horse hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, I'm just thinking that there is so much shame, I think, in this question, because we are uh, and of, often sort of uh, an identity of the new person, and then we're not no good at all in, in doing this. And But for me, it's been quite a recent and I just sent off a thank you to Sharon because I read her article very very recent and I was so uh, encouraged by it so instead of because I've been working 30 years on the edge of the university and outside in in all sorts of all sorts of, of projects so I'm very familiar with this question and then to look at it as I'm going to look back at it and try to learn from it instead and try try to look into the shame and the and that instead. So um, I think this is really, really an important question, Renate. So thank you for bringing that up. So much shame. Um, Dan Danielle? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, just a little nervous. Um, first, I just wanted to thank everyone for for what you shared i'm um i think my question has to do with with being a new scholar as as john mentioned i just graduated in december um, with my phd and i'm really feeling everything that has been said already and and trying to trying to figure out can i can i survive to to even attempt to change the system from within, or should I just like go in a different direction? Or is there a way to to you know dance in the cracks or or walk that line? 
Um, so if anyone has anything to share related to that, I, I would appreciate your, your insights. <laughs> I'll say something super quickly, but I, I always feel that um, it's going to sound very vague, but I think that the power of life and love is much stronger than the power of these like life negating and like um, death, you know, systems and institutions. And, and so I, I, I think that. Um, at least for me to keep that at the center is, is very, um, this idea. And because I think, um, again, like I think that the in and out metaphor, it has, um, it's not the same, but it has many similar, it bleeds into each other. So I think that the, the, the solution is not whether to move in the in and out, but to have sort of like a, at least for me, like a set of, set of sort of like, like a mission and a vision and a community and to existing relationships that can give you love and life and, and that allow you to negotiate like the contradictions or to put up with the, with the things that are. So at least, um, yeah, for me, it's been a lot about like, yeah, I don't know, carving the spaces that are necessary and being um, deliberate about the, 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 I guess, the why I am there and, and, and sort of, um, and the strategy towards like this future that I, with my community, I'm trying to fight for. Um, and it makes sense to be there for me at, at, at right now. Um, as it would, yeah, anyways, and, and, but I do, you know, you, you will bump into the things that you will bump into there and elsewhere in some ways. Um, Anyone else want to share in response or anything else? Carolina? Carolina, I don't know. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank all of you. Um, I really enjoyed everything. And I guess I just want to say that um, a little bit about the word failure and about, you know, like guilt and shame. I think, you know, we, we think about it as such a negative thing. Um, and actually it's just part of the process, I feel. And, and if we look at it as part of the process, then we can move through it. Um, and, and I feel like also, so when we accept that and we move through it, we also accept that it's, hard and it hurts and that's where I feel like we can try to find others in their humanity and our humanity you know like we need self-care and we need to care for others but care for others and ourselves within those failures and mistakes and everything you know so um I guess that's what I reflected from all this and wanted to share thank you I don't know if it's good advice or not, but following on that and the theme of failure, I think if you do get into a university space, which is a big if, and that's kind of the biggest hurdle of all, um, if you manage to find yourself there, you know, it's important to kind of reckon on the fact that within the academy, yeah, it is, there's competition, you know, if you're trying to publish in a journal, it's just a hard breaking process, you will get rejections, lots of rejections. And I think what one should tell oneself is that um, it's all a, you know, a rigged game. So what you have to do is send the same thing to the next journal and the next journal and the one after that or your book proposal, um, because everybody gets rejected. Everybody who's doing something, I think, that pushes back in any way is is subject to rejection. I remember <laughs> a rejection. I got two rejections in one day. That was in the day of snail mail when you you know you had to wait six months to hear anything from a journal. 
as an assistant professor, I managed to get two in one day. And um, I think that, I forget why I said that, good example of, of failure. Oh, you know, yeah, I've gotten comments from the journals like from sociology journals as simple as, well, taste varies. And, you know, it just doesn't suit us or the two people who read your work or whatever. Um, but I find that if, and same with grant proposals and all the things that are out there, if you keep going through that and you sort of recognize that it's not you at all, it's just the system that uh, all you have to do is get it in front of one person who understands or two people who understand. And that's pretty much a random idiosyncratic serendipitous kind of thing. But if you keep keep putting it out there, you more likely to hit on it. And if you uh, don't know that, and if you get discouraged from first, second, third rejections, um, you'll never get to that place, which is there, I believe. But it does, it takes such a thick skin and it's so kind of, um, I remember I, re I met, when I first met G Gustavo Esteva in, in, in Oaxaca, the way he introduced himself was telling me how many times he'd been um, fired, fired from jobs. And there was a long list, you know, I was fired here and then I went here, I was fired and then I went here and I was fired. And it was like, he was boasting about that. And that was really helpful for me because I, I had, um, you know, I've been burnt out, I've walked out and I've been pushed out of different institutions. And I found that regardless if it's mainstream or alternative higher ed, it's the same institutional power dynamic bullshit. So, you know, you can get a, and I did have, of, I, I was given a position in a university. People said, oh, it's like gold dust, it's so rare. And I didn't feel like that very early on. And I kind of kept that, but you know, like Sharon, you were saying like the integrity of what you do, or it's also like, there's always hopeful. I still am very close with some students I had with other faculty members where we created our own spaces of, you know, liberation, we started this wonderful group um, called the Amateur Academic Adventurers Club, a bunch of faculty, we sat around, drank wine, ate cheese, and we're not allowed to complain about work, just about ideas. And that was, that really got me through things. But I think it's just creating whatever spaces you can, you know, just to keep that positivity and support because higher education too, as a PhD student, as a student in general, as a staff or faculty, it, it's very it's very isolating. So I think prioritizing that networking, collective relational making is really crucial. Um, and that can always happen, you know, me heart to heart, whoever being, having that space, I think we can always empower ourselves and the situation to create that. So, sorry, I didn't mean to talk for so long, but um, would someone else like, like, like to share? Um, I had my hand up if it's okay. Hi everyone, my name is Ala and I'm coming to you from Tla'amin territory, which is also known as Powell River in British Columbia. And I think what you were just saying, Kelly, is important because I know Sharon talked about this around integrity versus being strategic. And I even found myself working for the last 10, 15 years with UNICEF and the UK government in various countries, reforming education that I never had complaints about my ability to be so multicultural and diverse, but I never felt I was being my authentic self. I felt like I was playing a part. And recently working for an indigenous nation where I live, I've had three formal complaints in the last few months and it really took me by surprise. And then I went, hang on, it's because I'm being my authentic self and I'm trying to engage differently and think differently as a settler colonial or a, sorry, a white settler here. And um, it really helped me learn and understand that it's not just me, it's the system and I have to navigate that internal space. And one of the questions I had is it almost feels like uh, similar to what Sharon said, there's this additional PhD that we all have to do in academia of learning around building our own resiliency and knowing how to be strategic. And I was sort of curious for all three of the speakers, as you start to grow uh, a group or a movement, you end up needing more hands on deck to just do the strategy. Who's who? Where can we influence? How does this work? What's the feedback? 
And then it gets too big or too complicated. And then it feels like listening to all of your contributions, it can stall. And I was sort of wondering your experiences of trying to work within the system. Do you reach a point where something gets too big and it just kind of falls apart? Um, how do you make space to do all of these strategic things when it feels like sometimes it moves away from the point of doing it to begin with? Thank you. Sharon, are you, you look like you want to speak. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I think it really just depends like what, what you want, like in relation to those questions I mentioned earlier, like what do you want the work to do? And I think like for, for our collective, it's very much, um, we think of the work as having its own like being um, and it's a living being and it changes and it morphs and um, we have to, both protect that being and and like let it have its own integrity and its own like life process and there's also all this translation that we do in relation to making that being or parts of it um, legible to a different space but in that translation you're always compromising something and so that's that's is this place where you ask about the integrity of the compromise um, and I think that you know, going along with that notion of sometimes we romanticize these alternative spaces that sometimes we cling to them when they're no longer useful um, or we want to keep it in place and it make it look like one thing when actually it needs to move and shift. So I think allowing that space for the work to breathe and have the in-breath moment where you look inward and the out-breath moment um, has helped us sort of uh, sustain the work um, over time as it changes. Um, but I think, you know, having a clear sense of like the direction you want to go and the, the, the movement that you're trying to do, as opposed to getting too tied up in the form of how it looks and it might look different in different times and places and being okay with that, um, which, it, which keeps it maybe hopefully from becoming this kind of staid institution that does um, stay beyond its time, which the university certainly has. So yeah, it's a great question, Ella, thanks. Um, anyone else? I know Carolina had her hand up as well as, as a response to, to Ella or, or um, another question, comment? Um, I, my internet went, but I, I had this thought that I, I of something, you know, and it's interesting. One of the things, something that I wanted to share is that, for example, prisons, and using it as a metaphor of an institution that is highly oppressive, highly violent, um, takes at least, well, yeah, a lot of what we consider or understand to be the freedom of people. But um, I was asked once, for example, like, can you do liberatory or emancipatory education or thought inside a prison, right? And, and many people will, you know, will, will think that you cannot. And in some ways, I, it's full, played with contradictions, but when allow, when, when you make space to visibilize that violence, it becomes a really powerful space to do emancipatory and liberatory work and to imagine freedom and to, and to think about it and to theorize about different futures. So I think similarly, like even thinking about my own cl like classes in, in the university, like there's so many young people who have this incredible wealth of knowledge and insight and, 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 and humanities that, that end up in these spaces. So I think that also um, even like highlighting and visibilizing the oppressive role nature and its compl the complicity of this institution um, can be like a very, um, generative and very like radical like space so you know, and, and i think um you know i i often yesterday i was hearing this conversation about somebody who's saying like what does it mean to start thinking of schools as something that is in the process of dying yeah, i don't know if you got my cut
I don't know. Oh, my my internet's down. <laughs> it's like up and down. So Hawaii has this happen all the time. Um, I um, I didn't know if anyone else was adding to it. I also was going to just ask about um, Anna's Anna uh, your your question about um, which I think we're kind of all getting into is like you know do we really need higher education when it's detached from solving managing real issues towards society's prosperity. I didn't know if you wanted to say more about that or anyone, sorry, my, my daughter just got home from school. Um, or if anyone wanted to, um, yeah, if we wanted to comment on that too. Oh, but it was this. I don't know. If, can you hear me? Okay, I yes. Um, well, it was is 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 this is a woman that's beginning to sort of like theorize, and 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 she actually has been getting lots of pushback because she's starting to to think of like the people who think about abolition and they ask them about like, do you really think that we're talking about abolishing schools? And they're saying yes, we are thinking about abolishing schools. And interestingly, I actually got a rejection from a journal uh, a week ago because they say I, they said I was too critical of schools. Uh, yeah, sort of like not all schools are violent places, right? Uh, so, and I was arguing, yes, they are extremely violent places, and we need to to to, to really denaturalize the amount of violence that is happening to young people in schools every day. Um, so, I think um, I don't know to the point of, of like schools as dying. I think her her argument is 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 it takes a lot of grief, and she was talking about grief to process the thought of some of these things dying. And we need to, to work through that um, and consider a possibility if we, in some ways, are to entertain the building of a different kind of future. Like, um, like we need to allow ourselves to believe that that is also a possibility and to kind of like grieve and process and think about what that looks like. And, uh, no, that's such that's such an important question about the kind of grief going along with. Um, I remember I, I worked with a student who did a her her thesis looking at the death of a school actually in the UK, and she spent a lot of time with parents and kids. And I mean, this is a different. It's different because it was actually a school they loved and they felt very connected to as a community school. But even that, it was, and they were all going to something else. But it was really fascinating about kind of that and they were excited about this new opportunity on the one hand but just the death of that was extremely overwhelming and and, and i think all of us are so wedded to it somehow too it's that all the all that coloniality that's been processed into us and i know i don't know how many of you are parents but having kids and trying to figure out how to navigate the system too with them is or on the edges of the system or whatever it looks like is is it is such a fascinating experience <laughs> So, um, yeah. anyone else want to want to? Um, I mean, we 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 have a few more minutes. Um, does anyone else want to bring any other? There was so much we've we've touched on. I think I think it's important not to go away from the session. Um, feeling awful. <laughs> And uh, I, I think, you know, we're part of a very big struggle. <clears throat> it goes way beyond us, it goes way beyond the universities. It goes very deeply to the, uh, the future of everything. And um, it's important, we tell ourselves in movements, it's important to stop and acknowledge the small victories. They're usually small, but do stop and acknowledge them, savor them. Um, have, I think networks are crucially important for supporting and helping us be more creative and imaginative and finding people to do things with. I mean, ecoversities is that. Um, and one of the important things about ecoversities, as this panel suggests, is that it's it's for everyone who really wants something different, better uh, to interact, meet, and 
try and start things and be part of things. And, you know, for anyone who's going that route toward the university, um, then, you know, look everywhere. For, the crack is a good term. Look everywhere for the cracks. Look everywhere for the people you want to work with. Look, love your students because you at least have a classroom and you can do all kinds of things there if you are imaginative enough really and willing to take risks and change. Um, so uh, even as my voice is kind of you know, reflects a certain grief or sadness. I, I really want to say that my heart tells me that, you know, none of us here are alone and that um, however awful a situation is, there's, I, I actually think there's always some, some ways to resist. Um, they may lead to death but one can, can take something from that. I don't know, I, I don't think enough about death, I try to. And um, what I do know is something I think Miguel said, it is about affirming life. We all know this, we all want that. And there are just so many. <laughs> the good news is really outside the university, isn't it? There's communities everywhere, there's activists everywhere, there's experiments going on everywhere. And uh, that's the other thing, if, if we can be in touch with each other and learn and take heart from that, um, the same to some small degree is true inside the university as well. So there's, there's a value if you're there to, um, to, I don't even know how to say it, be life affirming and look for those others and find them and what I've already said, basically. Peace back. Can I share a thought? Uh, I, I'm listening and I, I, I don't know what, uh, what kind of privilege we have to be here. And I said that because I chose and I have privilege to chose imagining a new kind of education in co-create and to go there. Meanwhile, I in the real world <laughs> in the, the, the organization that are so bad. And so I'm doing step by step to get there. And my shows is get out of organization at the university and building a new one, an university. It's my show because I have privilege to do this. But here in Brazil, I work with several young people that don't have privilege to choose being in a university formal or don't be, because for most of them, being in a uh, formal uh, university, it's a chance to, to have a good, good life. So I, I think, uh, okay, we disagree, we can disagree, you know, uh, we can agree and disagree in some points because I think the, uh, this is so, so related by the by uniqueness of this territory. And okay, I think we, 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 we must have people to find, to, to, to change the organizations and we need people to build a new one and we have to be a bridge. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Fabiola. I'm sorry, I, I, my 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 internet kept cutting in and out. I know I know we need to stop, and um, I just wanted to thank you all so much for being here, and Miguel and John and Sharon for speaking. Um, I know Sharon already had to leave. Um, I you know I 
I was going to just say in the parting, I also, I think there's always hope. I know Sharon talked a lot about finding those cracks and they're always there, you know, and, and, and the more like John, you were saying, the more we can connect and support each other. That's regardless of if we're in between beyond, you know, um, and that's the purpose of, of a gathering, this online gathering actually, is, is for us to get to know each other a little bit and, and begin that process. So there can be more solidarity. Um, uh, Boa Ventura de, de Susa Santos, who's one of the authors that is a part of this session I just mentioned in the chat, the Within or Beyond um, the University Experiences in Alternative Higher Education. This session is coming out of a, of a journal um, a special edition that was called and the process of writing that special piece was through also conversations. We had a conversation before we all kind of started our separate pieces and then after, and this is to continue that. And in one of the articles, um, Boa Ventura de Susa Santos talks about how, you know, we need to be addressing all these, I mean, it's urgent, but we need to be addressing all these you know, beyond university, we need to do all these things, continue and really focus on that, but we also need to defend the within and, and it can't be, it needs to happen all at the same time. And I appreciated that because I really appreciate his work too. So um, I just think that, yeah, I, it's, it's really nice hearing all the vulnerability and the honesty and the heart coming through um, over the last 90 minutes. And um, John, thank you so much also for saving the chat. I know the recordings here and, um, there can be continued conversation tomorrow and beyond. So I just want to say aloha and mahalo and nice to see all of your faces. And um, yeah, I hope to be in touch again. Thanks. Uh, Kelly, can I just ask um, sure. the, the, the session with uh, Boa uh, Ventura de Sosa Santos, that, that's the one tomorrow, 2 p.m. The one? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know if he's going to be part of that. I don't know if he's shown up for the session, but he's part of the journal edition where the people who are presenting are all authors. All, all the presenters, panelists are authors within that special edition. Um, so, but the, but the way it's being structured is as a conversation. So there won't really be kind of presentations. Um, it's been planned for a while. Um, so it's, it's a long one. It's like two and a half hours. So it's like a long conversation, plenty of time to kind of, dive in so okay great yeah all right i'm i'm gonna go see my kids but it's so nice to see you all thanks so much again bye bye